Um, um, I feel very honored to be here at the Collège de France. Uh, I have passed outside the gates many times, but that's my first time to be inside the gates. Um, so I'll talk about uh, object-centric machine learning, trying to tie machine learning with uh, 3D geometry. And uh, this talk is, of course, joint work with many people, uh, students, postdocs, and more senior collaborators that I will show during the talk. And it's, uh, I'll summarize in this talk at a rather high level a number of efforts in my group at Stanford that uh, are motivated by the desire to create programs or autonomous agents or robots that are able to act autonomously in the world or act in collaboration with humans to perform a variety of tasks. And uh, for both of these cases, it's clear that to accomplish this, we must somehow provide the agent or the robot with knowledge of the world. And so this brings me to the two key themes I will talk about in this uh, lecture, about uh, essentially organizing knowledge about the world in an object-centric way, and also exploiting 3D geometry in the process in order to do machine learning. Uh, well, the world is definitely complex, but it's also factorizable or decomposable because we have these uh, stable entities we call objects, like the chairs in this room, like people, like animals, like cars. And they're stable in the sense that the arrangement of them can change from day to day, minute to minute, but somehow their properties stay the same. They're carried by this stable entity. And we have seen uh, in computer vision uh, very significant progress in the last maybe five years where people are able now to find reliably objects and images and identify their, uh, their class, their type. And uh, this has used a combination of novel uh, deep learning techniques like uh, I show here an early version of one of these nets, the AlexNet. And uh, underlying this is uh, two things, the availability of a lot of data for training these machine learning algorithms, for example, the ImageNet database that Fei-Fei Li did at Stanford, and also lots of computing powers, uh, and especially of GPU farms that can do lots of parallel computation very fast. Now, at the same time, uh, I think this approach has some limits because it's, it sort of implies that understanding the world is simply categorizing objects into classes. And uh, in some ways, that is really unsatisfactory. First of all, because the number of classes of interest can be ever growing, and these machine learning techniques are very data hungry. So we, so we need more and more data as we have more and more categories but more fundamentally because the categories we are dealing with are not really independent pieces of knowledge. They are related, you know, being a dog is related to being a cat and so on. And this, and this structure of knowledge is not reflected in simply mapping uh, signals into semantic categories. Well, to address that, one would like to have somehow a computational representation of the ontology of knowledge about the world, and this seems like a formidable task. So to make it simpler, I'm going to go back to an old idea that was a very hot topic in computer science maybe 30 years ago, <coughs> object-oriented programming. The idea was that we can simplify the way we write programs. If instead of thinking of algorithms or programs as primary and then they just operate on some data, we invert that and we think of data as primary and associate them with methods, i.e. programs that act on that data. And the reason this inversion is, is that it was useful is because somehow the structure of the programs can become simpler if they know the type of data they operate on. So, you know, the addition operator might have to know about adding integers and rationals and floats and so on, but when you invert it and say, uh, add the, the addition method to the integer four, it's the integer method that has to be used. It becomes simpler, and I want to use the same notion here, that somehow the structure of knowledge about the world simplifies when we confine it to individual objects, because somehow the structure of the object provides interesting structure for organizing the appropriate knowledge. And so 
I'm going to be then object centric. And because of that, I will also be 3D centric. I will use 3D representations of objects as my fundamental knowledge representation. And the reason is that among all, all digital forms we have of physical objects, say your 3D models or images, 3D is the most faithful representation to the underlying physical object. It captures the whole object, not just one view of it, and it also doesn't capture any extra things like background and, you know, and, and occluders and so on. So the notion is that 3D can be good for some new things. Uh, we've seen 3D used to create beautiful imagery for, for TV and advertising, for, for various special effects, for games, for physical simulations, but the goal here is to use 3D for knowledge representation, to take a 3D model like of the Arc de Triomphe and then relate that to all images, videos, uh, 3D scans, uh, web pages, novels that, that refer to this artifact and somehow use that to index all the information provided about this object. And so towards this goal, we started an effort in my lab and some other labs a few years ago to start accumulating 3D models of everyday objects and add semantic information on top of them. And that's what we call ShapeNet. And again, the, the interesting part here is not just the geometry, but the semantic information living on top of the geometry, which can include, for example, symmetries of the shape or parts of the shape, uh, information about the size of the shape, the weight of the shape, your physical properties and uh, kind of hierarchies de describing shape to composition. And more and more, we are interested also in understanding physical interactions between humans and objects, because a lot of man-made objects have the form they have because they are meant to support a specific interaction with a human. And I will not discuss it very much until the, until the end. Uh, so how to organize knowledge? This is an interesting topic, and I'm starting to, to play with this using some mathematical ideas coming from Bentford Mandels and Sheaves, where essentially the notion is an underlying space, here the space of objects, and then the fibers living over each object is where knowledge is encoded about this object. As a vector space, typically I'm, I'm, I'm going to mostly be talking about encoding knowledge as function spaces living over the geometry of the object where, for example, you can think of every feature of a 3D model like, like curvature as a function living on the object. You can think of a part like my right arm as a zero one function, as an indicator function. So, so the claim is that semantic information can be encoded in an appropriate function space living over the object. And uh, so this uh, shows sort of this team view of knowledge where kind of related objects have shared structure, they can share some of this knowledge, but as you move you know, further away, that is not true. As, as you go from chairs to car to planes, there's not so much in common. And somehow it is this local structure that is captured by the shift metaphor. So this is the, the representation of knowledge, but to get to that, we have somehow to acquire knowledge somehow. So, so we need develop tools that from text and from websites and from images and from videos and from scans, we can suck 3D knowledge and put it on the model. And also we need tools to transfer this knowledge to new settings, because after all, this is the whole name of the game here, to allow agents and robots to operate in the world where they encounter new situations. They should be able to transfer this knowledge to the particular uh, environment that they're facing. So a lot of, I mean, a big issue here is transport. How do you transfer information and knowledge between visual data? And uh, I think of this that in the following way, any notion of similarity you have between 3D objects can be thought of as a channel for transferring information between them. It's, a, it's sort of a classic Shannon setting. Only now the similarity is the transport channel, something that you may know about the chair on the left perhaps can be transferred to the chair on the right if they are sufficiently similar. And like in the Shannon case, this is a noisy channel, transport is imperfect, and also the two objects aren't identical, so therefore not everything from the left can be transferred successfully to everything on the right. So I'll be interested in building various uh, networks that connect 3D models to each other and to images, 
at various levels, perhaps at the level of individual you know, vertices, if they are very, very similar, like what is the deformation of the other, or maybe at the level of parts, if they are less similar. And again, this, the central somehow goal is to relate 3D as an object representation to all other information we have about objects, to, you know, you know, to images, to videos, to, to 3D scans, to virtual environments, to product web pages, as a tool for sucking information from all of them. And of course, the advantage of having these multimodal representations is that different, different representations tend to capture orthogonal or, or maybe different information about the same object. So, and once we have that, then I mean the ultimate goal of this is to be able to transfer this knowledge to new settings, to take a picture and understand what's in the picture, because we can understand the object in the in that picture and transfer knowledge to them, or even to complete, you know. So we have here a partial scan of a chair. I'd like to be able to complete the chair, have the computer complete the chair, like you all can, because you have seen many chairs before. And if I show you this point cloud, you all know how to go to that, to that full chair. Essentially, we want the, comp the computer to be able to be able to imagine things that are not present directly in the signal. Okay, let me give you a small example. Start with about trying to record the knowledge on 3D models, and this is about adding part information. ShapeNet has about uh, you know three million objects, and here we took a small subset, about thirty thousand shapes in sixteen categories, and tried to annotate them with parts. Here's a picture of ShapeNet. It's available today, and it's, it's a joint effort between Stanford, Princeton, and UT Austin. And, uh, and the idea of this annotation exercise was to combine uh, human input, uh, crowdsourcing, together with algorithmic transport. So basically, the idea is that we show users views of various objects in the repository and ask them to paint a particular semantic region, like seat. And I'll show you in a moment the actual UI. Once we have this information from multiple users, then we use algorithms to propagate through the network this information to nearby objects, to other chairs. And actually, these algorithms are based on many different techniques. I'll explain only one of them later on. Uh, and then once we have this transported knowledge, then we go to a verification phase where essentially users are asked to, to verify the output of, of, of the algorithm. And uh, there are two interesting things here. One is that uh, the verification step is much, much faster than, than the annotation step. You can see here the user just checking the chairs that look wrong. But here you see the, the painting interface, which is much, much uh, uh, slower. And, uh, and throughout this, the goal has been to essentially minimize the, the user time to get all, all these models annotated using minimal user time. I want to point out another interesting aspect of this network is that the network is not fixed. The network learns which links work for which types of parts based on the user feedback, based on the validations. So, so although this project started as a way to generate annotated data, I think the very I mean, here's some of the examples that we got for uh, basic uh, you know, 3D types. You can see here, it's, uh, you know, these are not very fine parts, but they capture the core structure of parts of various objects. And I was starting to say that, to me, part of what's interesting here is not just the result, but the way we got there, because here is the network that shows in yellow the, the information that derives from human brains, in green, the information propagated by algorithms, and this is kind of a live structure because you know, the connectivity changes according to the, to the input you are given, and then new objects can be added and annotated. It's a bit like a brain. It has memory. This is the, the user annotations, and it has inference. It's able to apply this learned knowledge to new settings. All right. So now I'll show you some direct 3D <coughs> annotation Let's see about pulling information from images now. Uh, so this is the problem that I want to relate a, a clear image like here to a 3D model. And uh, 
Of course, these are the same objects, but in terms of the representation we have, they're quite different. So we try to find a common embedding space where we can store both images and 3D models so that nearby images and models are similar. And uh, we do this as follows. We create an embedding space using only the 3D geometry because, again, we feel this, uh, this is a more pure representation of the underlying reality. And putting in the images at this stage would, would clutter things up with background and so on. And then we try to learn how to embed images into this more pure space. And let me cover these steps in more detail. So first we build uh, the embedding space, as I said, using the 3D alone. This uses a distance metric, a similarity metric between shapes based on hog features and the light field descriptor. This seems to work quite well to capture the similarity and difference of shape classes, as you can see. Here's a little, and then we take this metric space and compute an embedding of it into Euclidean space using a multidimensional scaling and some sort of mapping to ignore the large distances which are less significant. And typically here we've used 64 dimensions for the embedding. And here I show a 2D projection of this 64 dimensional space that seems to capture well the, the different classes of objects. Now once we have that, then we try to embed images into the same space. And of course, that's a tough problem because images have many detractors. The lighting changes, the viewpoint changes, the background changes, the occlusion changes, and that's a problem where deep nets can come in. And, uh, and what we do is we train a deep net by using our own 3D models, essentially by creating synthetic images that, uh, that, uh, that, that represent a particular object in this, uh, in this embedding space. Here's an example of such images of chairs. As you can see, for example, the backgrounds are actually completely random. Chairs appear flying through space on buildings, on the ocean. But all that helps tell the network background doesn't matter. You have to focus on the only thing that matters, which is the geometry of the, of the object depicted. And in fact, in this work, each 3D model blossoms into a few million images where we vary again the viewpoint, the lighting, the background, the occlusions, and so on. And once we have this common embedding space, we can do things like go from images of objects to 3D models of objects, or go the other way from 3D models of objects to, uh, you know, to images of similar objects. Or we can go from 2D to 2D, from images to images, in a way that's agnostic to the poles, because these are all linked via this subtract embedding space that, that captures geometry alone. And I think this uh, business of training vision algorithms using synthetic data is really quite interesting and powerful. And we've used it in many other settings, for example, to estimate the pose of an object in an image. This is a hard problem to find actual a supervised data for because humans are not very good at estimating pose, but but when you can but when you can synthesize the data, of course you know the pose exactly. Of course there is the issue that the synthetic data is not exactly the same as the real data, and one has to understand this issue better than we do now. Uh, another interesting aspect is uh, you know through the work of companies like you know, Google and Microsoft and Baidu, there is very good algorithms to connect text and images because they exploit all the training data coming from websites. But there's not a very good way to, for example, correlate text and 3D because we don't have so many documents that include text and 3D models. But now we can somehow link text and shapes by images. We can, for example, if you go to the, to the 3 ball 3D warehouse and search for chairs with round back, well, there are some chairs with round back, but it's also a lot of garbage in here. And that's because the metadata that's in these mo model files is very bad, usually. On the other hand, if you go to Google and search for images by saying chairs with round back, you get very good results. And then using the common embedding space, you can pull 3D models that are now chairs with round backs. So again, this is sort of this power of linking, of transitivity. If you can go from text to images and images to 3D, you can go from text to, to 3D. 
And that's an example of once you have this linking between 2D and 3D, you can start sucking information from 2D onto 3D. For example, many of the 3D models we have are not textured. Many images of real objects have texture. Can we pull the texture from the object to the image, even though it's not exactly the same object? And I will not have time to discuss how we do this. It is not by building point-to-point -point mappings between these objects, but in a more abstract way. Uh, and then once we have transferred texture to one 3D model, we can transfer textures to many other models because somehow relating the 3D models is easier than doing that at the image level. So at the very end, we end up generating lots and lots of textured uh, 3D models, which means that we have better training data for computer vision algorithms because real objects have textures. And, and actually, we verify that experimentally that that's when you train with textured objects, say for pose estimation, the results do become better. Okay, so that's just two snapshots of this kind of grand plan of, of transferring knowledge from 2D to 3D. Uh, let me say a, a bit about one of the transport mechanisms that I mentioned based on function spaces and functional maps. Uh, again, to transfer information, we need to know what is the same in A and B. And this can be, again, very, very low level, like a pixel or a, or a vertex of a mesh, or maybe higher level, like parts. And, uh, uh, and again, the, I'm going to represent the information as functions living on the 3D geometry or living on the image. And, and I'll be interested also in operators, meaning things that take functions to other functions. And Specifically for the case of 3D, I'll be using a functional basis called the Laplace Beltrami set of eigenfunctions that I don't have time to go to in detail, but it's like a, like a Fourier basis for a general manifold. <coughs> and this brings up some interesting kinds of mathematics that has not been used so much before in computer science, in particular, fractal analysis methods for representing these functional spaces and doing things with them. For example, we have, we have made very good use of the risk representation theorem and also homological algebra for understanding essentially all these arrows, all these maps that relate different objects uh, to each other. And I will mention examples of that as I go along. And so let me talk very briefly here about functional maps. In fact, this is I'm going to work with Max, who's sitting right there, uh, that tries to represent correspondences between objects in a mathematically nice way as, uh, as matrices. And uh, here's the idea. If I give you, say, this cat and the lion, they're similar 3D models. You can think of the obvious correspondence that takes, I don't know, you know tips of the ears to tips of the lion to the cat and nose to nose and tail to tail. So for every point of the lion, you can have a corresponding point on the cat. And now, essentially, you can do a pullback of information from the cat to the lion. I show here as coloring. If I have any coloring, any function on the cat, I can find the corresponding function on the lion. How? By taking a lion point, taking the parameter map over to the cat and applying the cat function, the cat color. And I show here four different colors being transferred from the cat to the lion. And so essentially this is a mapping, an induced mapping of the function spaces, of the knowledge spaces living over the two objects. And uh, it's a very high dimensional thing. In fact, it's really, it's really a Hilbert space, infin infinite dimensional. Uh, but it has a nice property. No matter how complicated the initial primal map is, this map is always linear. It's a linear operator that maps the function spaces. And it allows us to use nice tools from, uh, from linear algebra and optimization. So formally, if I have a function basis for the two function spaces, say by the Laplace Beltrami eigenfunctions, which are known to form an L2 basis, then basically, I say I truncate these infinite Hilbert spaces at some point because this is a basis that it gets finer and finer as I take higher and higher indices, then, then for me, every function is just a vector in that vector space, the coefficients of the top, say, you know, 100 eigenfunctions. And if I have two corresponding functions that I want to relate 
by my operator C, this becomes just a linear equation where A and B are vectors and C is a matrix. And uh, the coefficients of this matrix are simply the representation of the image of the i basis of the domain in the basis for the range. So this is sort of this view of making maps linear operators. It has many nice properties that you can compose the maps by multiplying the matrices and so on. Also, as I mentioned, these are, it's a very high dimensional space. It allows us to express more flexibly the relationship between two shapes. It's not just a one-to-one -one type of mapping. You can map a point here to half there and half there, which is useful for capturing you know, ambiguities. It's also the case that nice natural maps tend to lead to very sparse matrices, as opposed to dense ones, which also make computation easier. So the way to estimate the mapping matrix is, of course, to start with a bunch of corresponding functions on the two shapes and kind of stack them up. These are the constraints that will define the linear you know, operator C. And with enough pairs, we can estimate C. And where are these pairs coming from? Well, as I mentioned earlier, any piece of knowledge that you have that should be the same ac across the two shapes can be expressed as a function and therefore as a vector in the corresponding function spaces. And I will have a mapping constraint on the matrix C. And these functions can be, can be curvature, can be various descriptors like the heat kernel signature at, at different time scales, or the wave kernel signature. There can be landmark points expressed as delta functions or as distance functions. There can be parts, which are zero one functions, and so on. So somehow here is where we're injecting supervision into the mapping process because we are telling the system what we care to preserve. Because if we're going to transfer knowledge, we have to know what here is the same as what there, in the sense that the knowledge I have about this point here can be transferred to this area or this point there. And even, or even higher order information can fit into this. For example, certain self-structure of shapes, like symmetries, the preservation of symmetry can be expressed in the same functional language, because the symmetry is stuffed by the self-map, and therefore has a functional form. And so in the functional uh, uh, framework, symmetry preservation means that mapping and then symmetrizing should be the same as symmetrizing and then mapping. And this means that this commutator should vanish. Here, S1 and S2 are the known symmetry operators of the two shapes, and uh, C is the unknown map. But again, it's a linear constraint that can be fitted to the same uh, least squares framework. And one can go on and on. For example, isometry can be added by adding commutation with the Laplace Beltrami operator. And I will not go into any details about this. And higher order things, for example, you know, conformality can be added in this form. Not everything is linear, but uh, uh, for example, you know, can, you know, area or volume preservation correspond to this orthogonality constraint <laughs> on the mapping matrix. But, but the bottom line is that's what you do. I mean, essentially, you are replacing your meshes of maybe 50,000 to 100,000 vertices by, by this much more compact representation in terms of the coefficients of these prop functions, these functions that capture interesting properties in terms of the um, the, the, you know, the eigenbasis for the two shapes. And typically, we'll be using m like maybe 100 to 200 you know, yeah, eigenbases. So this is not so large systems. And then the basic optimization is to, is to try to find this mapping matrix C that minimizes the error in mapping the descriptors of A to those of B, and then some kind of regularizer that captures higher level semantics about further structure that you want to, to preserve. And then you solve this system, this gives you a functional map, and there's a last step I'll say something about to convert that back to a point-to-point -point map, which it might not be. Uh, this last step is actually a bit uh, uh, tricky, uh, but, the, but, but the nice property is that the value, is, if you look at a delta function at a point, in functional form, that corresponds to just evaluating the eigenbasis at that point. And so basically, each, each point then becomes essentially goes from 3D to the dimension of the function space, say 200. Now you have a cloud of points in 200 dimensional space. You transport them over by the function operator and try to map them to the points that you have on the other side. 
And even if you don't do it perfectly, you can start doing tricks like you know, iterated closures pair that you will use in 3D to try to lock these two point clouds together. But again, I will not discuss these algorithms in detail here. Let me just show you some, some example of pictures. This shows how the error that we get in the map varies as the number of eigenfunctions increase. And you can see, I mean, by 150 or so, we have captured most of the benefit of using uh, 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 this representation. And these are some figures from the original functional maps paper that show with a small number of correspondences. And a part correspondence, because we have to, 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 to resolve the left-to-right ambiguity, we can get a, a state-of-the-art mapping method. So this is essentially a, a function transporter, an OLX transporter be between two shapes. And now I'll be interested to do that not just for a given pair, but for many pairs, to build a network where knowledge uh, flows around the network. And I'll show you an example here for these uh, human poses. So essentially, this you know, in, so in my setting, there's a function space, there's a vector space over each of these, uh, these uh, shapes, and then there are linear maps that connect them. And, uh, and if these linear maps express notions of sameness, then I should have some invariance of transport. I mean, if I transport some property of the arm here to this arm there and to this arm there and to this arm here, I should get the same thing if I transport it from here to there to there to there. And the question is, do we get this, this, this path invariance? This, this is a form of cycle closure or commutation. And it's exactly, I think, you know, what the guys who created homological algebra, some of them here, had in mind, uh, namely to design a consistent set of notions of space and maps between spaces to get all these diagrams uh, to commute. Now, the difference is that in the mathematical world, the maps were defined by, by mathematicians, and then, and then one would show the commutation involved. In our case, the maps are found by algorithms using noisy correspondences, so we cannot expect perfect, co perfect commutation, even if you know, the underlying shapes, they are all kind of variants of the same prototype, like a human. So what we can do is kind of invert the whole pipeline and say, OK, we have these dirty maps. We know that the real maps should commute. Can we somehow clean them up by using cycle closure or commutation as a condition? And so the notion is that, uh, say, if a map, say, from a pig to a horse, maybe there'll be some errors. But maybe if I map to some intermediate object like the cow, I will do better by composing the pig to cow and then the cow to horse map. And this map might have fewer errors. So the general idea then is to look at uh, all maps together and, yeah, and conceptually put them in this big mapping matrix where the ij entry is a block that maps in functionally object i to object j. And if these maps were to be perfectly cycle consistent or perfectly path invariant, then it turns out this big mapping matrix has to be positive semi-definite and have low rank. Because you know, all these cycle conditions reduce the rank of this big matrix. In, in fact, this matrix has to factorize, like I show here, because essentially, if I know maps from one object to all the others, I'm done, because every other map can be factorized for this object. So this low rank factorization is exactly what I would expect. If I don't have that, I can try to to project down to a lower dimensional space where that is true. And now I'm kind of cleaning up my maps by doing a certain kind of map processing. Like I can do you know, image processing or, uh, or geometry processing. And let me show you a small example of that in discovering shared structure in 3D geometry, finding common segmentations of shapes. Where again, we start with a class of shapes. Here they're all you know, chairs, stools, stuff like that, and we find dirty functional maps between them. And then we use somehow this, uh, this low rank machinery to produce you know, clean latent spaces that are consistent across the shapes. And then from them, I've, okay, the, the way 
that's done is it boils down to an optimization that has two parts. The first part is the big part, and that is convex. Uh, here we are using the trace norm as a substitute for, for small rank. And then there's another step that forces factorization. That is not convex, but is very local computation. And this gives us essentially a set of consistent latent spaces that we can, that we can aggregate using some, some local geometry cues into, into parts. So again, this is done without any supervision. This is done just from the structure of the data. So we basically take a whole bunch of 3D models, and then by, you know, by imposing this map consistency, the network is trying to compress all the information, try to route it in a way that is as lossless as possible, and then these shared structures emerge as the best way to compress uh, uh, the information and make the whole thing low rank. Okay. Uh, well, these days, I guess, no talk would be complete without talking about uh, uh, deep nets. And uh, in fact, I think there's a real place for deep nets here because the current deep net uh, architectures aren't very good when it comes to 3D. And here I try to play with the motto of, of College de France and ask, can deep nets learn everything? Uh, <coughs> so, yeah. We have these knowledge bases. Can we use deep nets to build methods that, that learn from these knowledge bases? So then they can apply to, to new data. And if you look at uh, 3D, you have an issue. Because in machine learning, a lot depends on the representation. And for 3D, we have many representations. We have point clouds, we have mesh, meshes, voxel grids, distance fields, and so on. Which one should we use? Well, if you look at what people have used, there's really only two. There is voxel grids, as I show here, or 2D images that are views of the 3D shape. And the reason that's uh, true is because the current dominant architecture, a convolutional neural net, requires regularity. It requires sort of this grid structure to be able to do the sharing of kernels at different locations and therefore optimize the number, of, the number of weights that is used during the learning process. But you know, for, th for, for the geometry, point clouds or meshes are much more natural. And these are not regular structures. So how can we, how can we design 3D, I mean, 3D learning architectures for this type of data? So I'll show you a couple of efforts in this direction. One is to use point-based representations. So basically, we want to go from a point cloud, develop some kind of a deep net that uh, ends up giving us, I don't know, object classification, parts, semantic segmentation, and so on. And uh, here is a, a first attempt to do that. This net, the, you know, the basic net is here. The blue part is what gives you classification. The input is in an ordered set of points with their x, y, z coordinates, just a bag of points, each of them three numbers, x, y, z. And it has two sections. This section here that processes each point independently and effectively amplifies the knowledge we have of this point from three numbers to a thousand numbers. And then here is the, the aggregation section wh where somehow we do something to combine all corresponding values per point. And actually, we found the best aggregator was max. And this has to be a symmetric function, because you don't want the, the, you know, the outcome to depend on the order that the points are given. So effectively, the network is learning to solve interesting optimization problems on the point cloud and picking the interesting points. And then these descriptors get aggregated and become a feature vector from which, for example, classification can be done. And if the goal is to uh, do, say, segmentation, then we have this, this branch where local information, as shown here, is concatenated with, with global information to produce on a per point function that can be the, you know, the seat function for the chair, the, you know, the base function, the back function, and so on. Another important part of this network is there are these two special transforms here. This essentially try to canonicalize how the net looks at the, at the point cloud and are learned as part of the data. 
And this guarantee is actually invariance to transformations, to things like you know, rotations and so on. So I think this, so mathematically, there are two interesting aspects here. One is that actually this architecture can approximate up to any given error, any symmetric function, by something like this, essentially. You take some independent function over, over each point, max it, and then kind of multiply it by something. And we can show formally that it's that's the approximation. And the other is this transform net that I showed there. Uh, first of all, this is just a small matrix. It's a three by three uh, matrix of the 3D points. And this guarantees essentially canonicality to the pose of the object. And here's some examples of what this gives, uh, say, classification for scans of objects or part segmentation for for point clouds of objects or semantic segmentation for a scan scene. Uh, here's some more examples of object segmentation obtained with uh, this approach. You can see that this is not perfect. I mean, there are clear errors. Uh, and here is semantic segmentation. We give it essentially a 3D point cloud. Again, the color is there, but it's not used. The, can the net only use X, Y, Z? No, no RGB from that, it computes sort of object class as I show here. Um, as compared to the volumetric and view methods, the quality that we get is, is comparable. I, I cannot say that it's better than the view method, but this is much, much faster, both in terms of space used and in terms of uh, time. So this may be good methods for you some, someday on a cell phone, you know, on a smartphone, that many of them now start to have your 3D scanners in, in them. Uh, right. And I think this is an interesting slide. What I show here, color just means depth. On top, you see the original point cloud. And down here, you see the winner of the max competitions. These are the points that this function selected as being most salient, most interesting. And it's, it's kind of interesting that they mostly agree with our human intuition about what points capture the semantic structure of the shape. OK, I'm running behind, so I'm going to go a little bit fast about the remaining parts. Uh, we also looked at um, graph-based representations, where, again, the goal is to be able to learn how to transport functions living on shapes. In this particular work, we didn't use the mesh structure. We used simply a point sampling on, of the shape, and then the points are connected to their nearest neighbors. So it's a graph representation. And we want to transfer things like shape parts or key points. <coughs> As I mentioned, uh, a, key, a key aspect of convolution architectures is they need the regularity. Once you have a graph structure, in general, you don't have this regularity. So it's not clear how to you transport a kernel from this region of the graph to this region of the graph. And that's one point we try to solve by going to a dual space, going to a function space. So now, as I showed earlier, I can think of the dual space of functions living on the geometry or on the graph. And the nice thing there is that convolutions in the primal space become just multiplications of the coefficients in the, primal, in, in the dual space. So you don't have to deal with this issue of the lack of regularity. But you have to deal with the fact that each of these function spaces is obtained independently. So a function that has the same coefficient, coefficients over this chair and over this here might look quite different because the corresponding function bases have never been aligned. So to, to deal with this, we have somehow to bring them, bring all the objects into a canonical framework, a canonical functional framework, not kind of 3D framework. And we do so by essentially estimating or having the net estimate functional maps that map the, uh, the functions of each object into this canonical object. This, this uh, latent canonical object where you know, the alignment is done and now a learning can take place. And, and again, this is a bit like the, the, uh, this, the, the special transformer that I showed earlier here done not, 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 not in 3D space, but at the level of this functional space, essentially. So that's a rotation in the functional space that tries to align the function space of this chair to a canonical functional space. And as you can see, this makes life better. I mean, now corresponding functions look, look more similar on the two shapes. OK, so these are the two key ideas here. Use the dual space to get 
the outside, I mean, to, to get around the problem of regularity in the graph structure and use synchronization to make sure the functional basis uh, talk the same language. And uh, these are the basic steps. We have a forward transform, spectral multiplication, backward transform, and the synchronization. And the whole net looks like this. It's a little bit complicated because the nonlinear step we cannot, we don't know how to do in, in the functional space. So basically, this net transforms, convolves, and transforms back, and then does the nonlinear step, you know, the real use, and, and keeps doing that at different scales. And that's the basic structure of this net, and uh, seems to do fairly well in terms of uh, these test data sets. Uh, here are some examples of, of what it gives. And plus one can, can also do the same thing, not just for segmentations, but for your key point. But, but in any function you want, I mean, if any function that expresses knowledge over the shape in this form can be learned this way using, using this approach. Uh, I have two more topics I'll mention very briefly. One is going in the other direction using point clouds, not as input, but output. I want to generate 3D now. I want to have a deep net that generates 3D. And uh, so the idea is take an image, take an object in an image, and generate from just this one image a point cloud that represents the corresponding object. And I show here the point cloud in the original view and the point cloud in a different view. And so this is sort of the structure here. We have, again, shape net models. So we take uh, a model, we generate a picture, we generate a point cloud, it's a bunch of points, and then we want a deep net that generates a very similar set of points so that the loss is small. And again, this is a place where having you know, synthetic training data from shape net makes a huge difference. And uh, the loss function here is, is a bit sophisticated because we are comparing, you know, a given shape can have many point clouds that are presented equally well, and somehow we want to say, even though these are not the same point cloud, their distance is small, so we use a transportation distance, the earth mover distance. In this case, and we have to, of course, formulate it in a way that becomes end-to-end -end differentiable for learning. So there's some interesting technical issues here that I will not go into. Uh, and now the, the net is, is kind of standard the way it starts because the input is an image. So, so we're doing embedding <coughs> in, into some space and then a predictor that generates the point cloud. And so this part, the embedder is just a regular you know, covnet. And the interesting thing is what is this part, the predictor. And it turns out shapes tend to have a lot of self-similarity, a lot of regular structure. Like I showed here, there's kind of smooth areas, flat or, or kind of cylindrical, with a strong local correlation with, between the coordinates. But they also have certain kind of unique special points like corners and angles. So we found that it's better to separate the net in two parts, a standard Deacon branch that focuses on the smooth part and a fully connected branch that focuses on the more you know, individual, uh, special uh, 3D structure. And then we simply have each of them generate a bunch of points, because most of them come from this branch, but some of them come from this lower branch. And so the Deacon branch essentially kind of lends this parameterization, this smooth mapping into 3D space, and the fully connected branch tries to learn intricate structures. So here's a, a, so an example. The blue part is what the fully connected branch has learned, and the red part, uh, uh, sorry, the, the ticon of the, you know, the smooth side has learned, and the red part is the more you know, special points that the fully convolutional, that, that the fully connected uh, branch has learned. Here's uh, some examples of output. Uh, again, I show the, uh, the, the object in the same view and the ob object in a different view. As you can see, I mean, it doesn't see the tail of the aeroplane very well, but it generates something that is uh, sensible. And uh, this is how it compares with other extant efforts. I will not say more due to lack of time. Here's some more examples. Uh, and again, I want to clarify that this was trained over all classes jointly and, and is able to to be applied to new classes 
like shapes that the network has not seen before, like these two examples here. Not everything is perfect here because this seems like, like a regression problem given an image, give me the 3D point cloud, but sometimes images can be ambiguous. There can be multiple point clouds that are quite different in their structure in 3D that correspond equally well to the same image. And when that happens, and for example, I don't know if you can tell, these are two different poses of the same chair. One facing towards the front, the other facing towards the back. But they look very, very similar. So when the net is tossed with solving this problem, it has a hard time because it tries to hedge its bets and somehow compute some, some convex combination of the two solutions. So there's so this this kind of interesting problems to, to think about here. Uh, okay, let me end just extremely fast by saying this is mostly in ongoing work, and I think there's much more to be done here about capturing not just geometry, but physics, how things interact. Um, so how humans sit on chairs, how humans grasp cups, where we encode not just the geometry, but also the, the dynamics, you know, how things happen over time. And, uh, and it's a bit different from, say, classic work in computer vision, that, that activity recognition, because we're looking for more than just a name. We're looking for actually the motion of the hand that, you know, in grasping the cup, not just that the hand in grasp the cup. And again, there's, a, there's other efforts that, that talk about the semantics of various actions, but, but, but at, at a very high level. So when I go down a bit more to the details, and so one thing we've looked at is how to capture data for this, and this is not trivial because most interactions are contact interactions. Contact means occlusion. Occlusion means you don't see. So we actually played a little bit with some setup where in the interaction we have two objects and we make one physical and the other virtual. So this fellow is wearing an Oculus headset, is looking at a virtual cup, and is trying to grasp the cup with his real hands, while a 3D scanner is washing the real hands. So now we can see the hands. Even that is far from perfect, because of course we can capture the approach to the cup, but not the actual contact, because we don't have all the compliance that comes from holding the actual object. So we've played around with a way to represent this information in a way that is abstract, so we can compare different interactions by effectively partitioning the space around the object into cells and then somehow representing trajectories of particles on the moving object as vector fields in these cells and summarizing statistics of these vector fields. And so with something like this, we can, for example, you know, differentiate an approach to a cup from above versus an approach from, uh, from the side because their descriptors will look different. Another interesting problem that comes up in these settings is not just recognizing objects and images, but the state of objects. That is, is this, this a chair here, but is the chair empty or full? Door, door, but is the door open or closed? Cup, cup, but is the cup empty or full? It seems to, to understand interactions, we have to understand that many of them have as a goal a state change for an object. So we've been playing a little bit in this direction, and maybe due to the lack of time, I'm just gonna skip through that for now and simply go to the end. Uh, so to, to finish, uh, the goal here is to say that you know, 3D can have a primary role to play in understanding how to represent knowledge about the physical world. And to really do that, we have to focus on essentially all the connections between the different media, 3D images, video, 3D scans, text, and so on. And we need better tools for machine learning with 3D data. I think what I showed is just a, ve is just a very bare, bare beginning. So to summarize, there are two key ideas in this talk. One is of building networks that trans transfer information between different objects. This can be 3D models, can be images, can be mixed networks. And the one lesson we learned is that transfer is a little bit easier in in 3D, because somehow they are more complete, more faithful models to the underlying physical object. And second, that we need to develop architectures appropriate for consuming and producing less regular structures like geometry needs. And uh, so I'm going to end by uh, thanking the several students and postdocs and, and collaborators who have contributed to this work and also my, my my sponsors for the funding 
that made this possible. And uh, I'm going to stop here and take questions. <laughs>